magazines, Joe Caron is a frequent contributor to them. He has Africanized bees, but fortunately for us, he keeps those in Bolivia. And he has European bees in Oregon. He's been professor of entomology or some such subject in about 100 different universities. So let me introduce you to Joe Caron. Thank you, Chris, and good morning. Uh, pleasure to be able to join you on your program. It's been a while since I've been to uh, either one of your regional or, or the state meeting. I've uh, been to a couple of national conventions that, of course, have been in your state. But it's a pleasure for me to return. As indicated, I'm off from here to go keep other bees. I'm going to Bolivia, where my, uh, fam my, my wife's family is, and I keep Africanized bees there with a nephew. And we're into eucalyptus right now. So as soon as I get there, we'll start harvesting eucalyptus. With Afghanized honeybees, you have to keep harvesting or they just quit, they leave, they abscond on us. So you have to kind of keep harvesting them. Uh, I looked at the original program, um, and with, uh, with uh, following Jerry Hayes is always intimidating. Um, I'm sorry that he is not here, but certainly trying to do the same with uh, Tim Tucker um, is, a, is a, a bit of a stretch always. It is a pleasure, though, to be here. I'm going to talk today, uh, this first talk, and I'll be back this afternoon, but the first one's going to be about anticipatory beekeeping. Now, Tim, I want to take a couple uh, snippets from what Tim said. One, he said that it is not easy anymore to keep bees. And back, we remember the old days, don't we? And then the good old days. <laughs> and then the old days when uh, the apistan worked very well initially when the mites were here. It is more difficult. And also then uh, um, very much uh, emphasize the point that he made. Beekeeping is local. All beekeeping is local. Um, you can be an association from one side of the county to the other and, and be talking about some differences just within your local association. So um, I guess a good point to start then, if I'm going to say something about anticipatory beekeeping, let me ask you the question, what is beekeeping? What is beekeeping? Now, as indicated uh, by Chris, I've taught at a number of universities. I've developed a, a beekeeping course, and this has led to uh, this textbook. Uh, a, a box has mysteriously not appeared, so I have, actually have only a few. A couple of our other vendors have them. Be glad to, uh, to uh, autograph for you. Um, and in the first test or first quiz, I asked the students, what is beekeeping? So for you that are beekeepers, you know, 50 words or less, what is beekeeping? Of course, I get answers like, beekeeping is fun, okay? Uh, but they're not gonna get full credit unless they talk about stings, because that sometimes is not so much fun. I quit after about 100 stings a day with my Africanized bees. Then I then go back, recover a little bit uh, before I go back again, okay? Um, <laughs> beekeeping is an interesting hobby. Lots of good answers, lots of more words on that. Uh, beekeeping is colony population management, okay, because without numbers, um, they don't do the same thing. They don't give us uh, our pollination service, don't give us our honey production. One answer I do like is this one, that beekeeping is anticipation, not reaction. So the other 47 words, how would you define that phrase? Beekeeping is anticipation, not reaction. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to try to indicate some of the ways that we might um, indeed help define beekeeping with this type of a definition, anticipation, not reaction. So alert, alert, alert. Um, spring is going to come early. It probably came early. Fall is going to extend, or it's going to be short, or whatever, okay? So one of our things about that local beekeeping is no season is ever the same. And that's one of the joys, one of the pleasures of beekeeping, because it's always a learning game. I think, I'm not sure if Tim said it, but I always say it, um, I've been in bees only 50 some years. When I finally learn what it is all about, I'm gonna get out and do something else. Take up golf or build that sailboat in the basement that I've always wanted to do, whatever. Um, my wife doesn't see me as a retirement plan, okay? Been retired almost 10 years now, and she says, you're working harder than you did before. I said, but I'm loving it a lot more, okay? All right, so anticipatory alert. Spring, fall, 
We have to go with the seasons. We have to go when the flow is um, because those things do change. Now, I hope this is not your coming winter, but it might not be what the books say or what it was last year probably, okay? So anticipating. This year especially has been a very tough team for some bee year for some beekeepers, and we certainly um, uh, feel for them uh, because of no fault of their own having to have to pick up the mess that uh, Mother Nature has made. Um, is part of this our anticipation of global warming? When I started in Maryland in uh, 1970 as a university professor coming from Cornell, I did um, measurements of, of um, when colonies grew, when they were at their maximum in honey production for about 10 years. And then my successor did not. And uh, then it was picked up in the, in the 2000s by a researcher at, at uh, a National uh, Science Foundation and did another 10 years. And we were totally surprised. Spring was coming 28 days earlier in the Beltway around Washington, D.C. in that intervening time. And so the crop that we relied on, tulip poplar trees and locust trees, the bees were building up on. They weren't yet at that strong point to take advantage of them. And so all of a sudden we weren't getting honey crops from what were very reliable ones, global warming. So we have to maybe anticipate that. Start with another question. I asked, what is beekeeping? So here's a second question for those of you who come in. Um, I asked initially, what is beekeeping? So this one is, why are you a beekeeper? Why do you keep bees? What do you think your objectives? What are your expectations in your care of colonies, in your keeping of colonies? Person sitting next to you may be very different, okay? May be very different in their their reasons for keeping bees, their expectations, okay? Are you because it's an interesting, doable hobby, okay? Are you in bees because it's what we do? For many of the commercial beekeepers, they all it's like this. It's in the family, runs in the genes. Um, that's what my pappy did, my grandpappy did, perhaps a great-great-grandpappy, et cetera. It's what we do, all right? It's a fun, healthy habit. Get you outside, out of the house, and yes, those things... The bees are trying to communicate something to us. Yes, those things can be a therapy, can be good for our health. As I say, after 100 with my Africanized bees, I quit for that day, but I'm back the next day, perhaps getting another 100, okay? Increasingly, this one I never got a few years ago, but increasingly we get beekeepers that want to save the bees. They've heard about this issue of, of the headlines, of a crisis, epidemic. So they're in bees because they want to save the bees. Others because they'd like to, they've heard about bees and they think they, ha they know they have an outlet, they can sell some of it, give some of it away, uh, but get a little bit of income, okay? Others do want to produce product, honey, pollen, as Tim indicated, that's what I produce with my Africanized bees, that and propolis. They're terrible honey producers, but they're fantastic pollen and propolis producers, and that's what we sell, the nephew sells in Bolivia, okay? Pollinate. All right, want to pollinate, um, that often turns into another good location for your bees because we move them to another location. This is a monoculture, uh, but depending on how big the, this, the uh, fields where you move them are, there may well be some weeds, may be some other for bees, okay? And of course, most of us, it's because we're after the riches and fame, all right? So why are you a local beekeeper, all right? Uh, we define beekeepers a little bit by size uh, and, and numbers of holdings. Um, not how big we are or how much winter fat we put on our, our bees or upon ourselves. Now, I like to talk about beekeeping as an umbrella. We're under a big, big, big umbrella. A number of the people that are starting in our communities, particularly in our suburbs, are off on this end. This is a scale. There's no one right place to do, to be, um, and no really one right way to keep beekeeping. Uh, these are people that um, um, want to have bees but don't want to look in the boxes because you do, they, they might sting, or you get sticky honey on your fingers, or you get propolis all over, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, individuals that don't want to do any treatments, probably not even feed sugar, some of them. Uh, we might call these, or they're calling themselves these days, Darwinian or apocentric beekeepers, no treatment beekeepers. Those are, they're slightly different definitions of those, but, but that's, that's off on one side of the scale in terms of the natural beekeepers, less intervention, um, less externalities, such as feeding and mite treatments, et cetera. 
Um, now, your courses in your local associations, um, and what uh, Jen Berry did yesterday, was to try to talk about responsible stewardship of our colonies. So we're not necessarily teaching this part extensively or exclusively, the natural beekeeping, nor are we on the other side of that sale, our large-scale beekeepers, that have livestock, and they're treating their bees like livestock because indeed they are. They're getting benefits from states for taxes, et cetera, because they're keeping livestock. An essential part of U.S. agriculture uh, with the pollination of about 90 different crops, some that, we, that give us the color and variety on our plate. Very, very essential. The, the, the key ingredients often in production of some of those other crops of other farmers, all right? Um, and they are into treatments, right? They are often doing treatments. Response, and, and so we may talk about that as well in these introductory courses and in your own uh, association courses, but probably we're somewhere in the middle. Probably we're somewhere in the middle. Yes, uh, maybe we're talking about the alternative hives, which the, some of the natural people prefer. And yes, we're talking about what it takes to get bees ready to move to a pollination site. And individuals that have a few colonies that want to perhaps bump up their income may look for local places to rent their colonies. All part of this big umbrella that I'm talking about, okay. Um, the middle uh, group is, is um, this group, uh, individuals that are, are anticipating, not reacting, to come back to my theme, uh, individuals that are trying to keep bees rather than the other way around, having the bees keep them. In other words, reacting to what the bees are doing, what they see in the bee colony, or, or, or what, what they perceive there, there is happening, reacting, not doing, uh, not anticipating, not being ahead of the bees. And uh, there are a number of names we can apply to ourselves as the vast, the vast unwashed middle, the ones that are struggling, trying to learn a little bit more every year. As I say, 50 plus years for myself, um, Tim, I think, said about the same thing, that you know, we're still learning, still, still benefiting from the bees and from our experiences with bees. Um, those that are working what I would call working towards treatment free, um, not necessarily enjoying the having to, to get all that sugar, all those trips to the store and get sugar and mix it up and spill it on our boots and down our pants and, and uh, uh, get in, in trouble with the rest of the family because we mix it up in the kitchen sink. Just, this probably has never happened to anyone here, but just on occasion that may happen. Um, you know, where we're, we're trying to, to look at the, the bees in a whole bigger context and get from that what we want in terms of our objectives, our reasons for keeping bees. The term IPM is referring now to the mites, so that we, we, we've got a formidable foe, a, a real formidable foe in the varroa mite, and we need some better tools than we currently have. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about those tools here in the next couple minutes, okay? And, and in that context, I like to think of, of myself as a beekeeping steward of going to the job of a tackling this formidable foe, the Varroa mite, with my toolbox, my toolbox of tools, okay? Just as I don't go to the bee colony forgetting, hopefully most of the times, not forgetting my hive tool, or searching around in the grass for where I put it down and finding it again, or my smoker, or my veil, my gloves if I want to use them, my bee brush, an extra queen cage, my toolbox in other words, and occasionally of course we go without it. Well here's my toolbox um, when I sometimes go do the honeydew list, like pick, pick, fixing the back screen door, etc. But sometimes that doesn't get it, and with varroa mites, we better, uh, are better stewards, and we might be a better um, uh, issue in terms of trying to do with this formidable foe if our toolbox looks something like that. Okay, they have all the advantages with European bees. I don't do anything, by the way, with my African bees with varroa mites. I don't have to, because the bee itself is better able, better equipped. The African bee strain is much better equipped to fight varroa mites. So much better than our European bees that we have here, okay? I still have a toolbox, and I still um, may, may integrate that with my other managements of pollen, et cetera. There was a conference out on the West Coast, California, where else, of course, in December last year called Be Audacious. Have you ever looked at the white boxes 
um, that you got your bees in or whatever color you keep your colonies and thought about things outside that box? Have you, have you transported yourself outside the box? Thinking outside the box, a key phrase here, what's the most audacious idea you ever had about what you might do with the bees? It's probably a great big mistake, and hopefully you learn from it, but what was that great big audacious idea? Well, this was a whole conference of some of our leading industry speakers and then conference with it. So here are some of the dichotomies that they discussed in thinking outside the box. What about the hive? Is it important that we have an alternative hive if we want to be a natural beekeeper? Uh, what about uh, keeping bees in movable frame hives? What are, what's responsible about that? Um, honeybees, I want just pollination and I want uh, uh, plants for my, the wildlife in my community. Um, uh, so I want bees, but do I necessarily want honeybees or am I thinking some of the native bees of the hill country of Texas or South Texas or, or a big thicket in East Texas, et cetera? Native bees versus honeybees. Um, big, big issue. Um, if I have what I suspect as damage from pesticides, should I report it? Well, many of us would think yes, because actually, as it turns out, as we're talking with EPA, uh, something that Tim has been doing as president of the Federation, what, almost monthly, almost weekly in some cases, part of that job, the, the job of being president of a national association, um, they say, they, and they have said very publicly, that unless it's on paper, they don't know there's a problem with bees and pesticides. Unless there's an incident report, unless it's been reported. Well, of course they know, but with their mandate, they really can't do anything unless it is on paper. So should we report it? Well, obviously we should, but there are issues for those individuals that end up reporting it. They may, if you have ever used something that isn't quite what the label says, of course no one in this room has done that, but if that ever happens, not quite what the label says, they can come after you because you report your bees being killed or possibly killed by a pesticide. So there are two sides of this thinking outside the box, pesticide reporting damage. Who a biggie, a biggie, biggie. What queen do you want in your colony? Okay, uh, locally selected versus uh, someone else's idea of what you need where your colony is. Someone else's in total idea of what you need in a queen, or what you need of that package when you put them in your hive, or what the nuke might be. Okay, that's someone else's idea. Is that anticipating? Perhaps local selected stock locally adapted by uh, organizations, local associations, or individuals that are rearing them, honestly rearing them, then maybe that's another concept. So there's a huge divide, a huge dichotomy for us here. Um, treating for varroa mites versus the not treatment. I'll mention that one all right. Antibiotics, we should prophylactically treat our colonies with an antibiotic for American fowl brood because, just in case, because, just in case, because I don't want it, none of us want it. When we get it, there's not much you can do other than destroying the colony. So if there's an alternative, such as treating with, uh, prophylactically with an antibiotic, why aren't all of us doing that? Versus getting rid of the pathogen when it rears its ugly head. Hobby versus commercial, migratory versus stationary. Okay, so we've got all these different dichotomies and again, um, just as that scale, that big umbrella I showed, there's no one right place to be on any of these. Whether you're on one of the extremes, whether you're in the middle of these discussions, wherever you might be. All right? So if you ha um, Mark Winston did a great report on this Be Audacious conference. So if you have trouble falling asleep at night, download this, read a couple of pages, and, and it may help your, may improve your getting to sleep at night. Okay. But, but there's a lot of interesting thought. You might really enjoy that, okay? I know this doesn't show up. This is way too much. Let me give you the roadmap of where I'm going to go in the next couple minutes. I talked about climate, how that we need to anticipate as much as we can. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about Varroa mite, since it's number one, number one, number one. There's really no, often no number two. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, uh, food, nutrition of bees as well. 
Uh, what I'm not going to really cover are pesticides, those things the bees are exposed to outside, the things we expose to them inside when we use them in our colonies, nor will I talk about our products and what it might be doing to the products that, that we call pure and 100% uh, natural, et cetera. So that's a bit of a roadmap, and I'll then finish a little bit by, by um, us, you and us, okay, you and I, the, the beekeepers themselves, all right? Now, a bit of context. You have, you've heard various um, things about what's happening with bees, and I mentioned there's some people that start bees because they want to save the bees, all right? So what is really happening? Here are some real headlines. There's a lost crisis in bees. There's an epidemic of bee losses. There's unprecedented levels of bee losses. Bees are going extinct. And the people that gave us the term killer bees that we're stuck with, Time Magazine, have given us a term for this and put a dead bee on the cover okay, of Time Magazine. So what is really happening? Okay, Here, um, I hope you can see most of this, the top graph, the blue line, is an estimation of bee numbers gathered by uh, surveying people that have five or more honey-producing colonies in our U.S. This is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You see the number, the vertical line here, this vertical line represents when we coined CCD, that's 2006-2007, uh, um, and the numbers were below 2.5 million. The last year they were at 2.78 million. Prior to that, the highest in this 25-year graph is 2.9 million. So if we're going to believe those headlines, then what is really going on? If our colony numbers really have not changed, they dipped a little bit, but now they're back. The second line here, the red line, shows Canadian numbers. They did not get the bee mite as, as soon as we did, and they had some different tools when it did come. And the last line down here shows an FAO, uh, United Nations estimation of the number of bee colonies in the world. Okay? So all those headlines that I showed in the, in the previous slide, is that uh, 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 real? Um, some uh, individuals would like to say, and I, and I think part of the answer of why our total numbers have not dipped be, despite some very significant losses is because there's a demand. There's a demand for bee colonies. Not for honey. The honey you had, unless it was your own today, came from somewhere else, came from another country. 75% of the honey we use in the U.S. came from somewhere else. Uh, the 25 is, is, the, is the real stuff, is, is the genuine stuff, and the, I hope that's what you had this morning. What our commercials are doing is they're supplying bees for pollination. And there's a big demand, increasing demand, and they're making money at it. That's why they put them on these trucks and truck them from here to California, truck them back uh, perhaps to the Dakotas, et cetera, for this pollination demand. So it's plain old capitalism, supply and demand. And we can't import that demand for pollinators. We may be able to import the product, but not the bees themselves, OK? Um, so um, all of that other than is that, using a term so popular today, those headlines is that fake news, all right? Well, let's come at this one other way before you perhaps make a judgment. Um, I have participated since the beginning with the Bee Informed. The Bee Informed, and I know a number of you have. This is the symbol here in the upper corner. And we've been surveying since that uh, dreadful spring at the Austin uh, meetings of the Federation where we actually coined the term CCD. Uh, we were wrong. We said uh, colony collapse disease. We were wrong. It's not a specific disease. It's a syndrome of several, including viruses, including nosema perhaps, um, sometimes tracheal, some other conditions. Um, so it's not actually a disease. It's a disorder, CCD. But we've been surveying um, the bee uh, people, the, uh, the, the producers, then since then. Initially, it was a lot of the large scale. And so the re way to read this is as much as you can see of it. The light yellow shows the overwintering losses. This is the period from October to um, uh, April. We run the survey the month of April. Many of you here are well in your bees before April. I hope you are well in your bees before April but we're looking for that period of downtime for the colonies. And you can see the number is varied. This past year, our 11th year of survey, we had the lowest level of overwintered losses uh, across the U.S. That was 21%. That is average about 30, 29% over the previous 10 years. The darker bars represent seasonal losses, not just overwinter, which is included, but also the active season. 
So that's your, your February on through to your this time of year when you're still active with your colonies. Queen events, um, backing your truck over your bee colonies, uh, never very good for the bee colonies, things like that, losses of colonies, all right? Um, and that this past year was at 33%, uh, just barely uh, above the lowest that we've reported. Now we haven't been doing that survey quite as long. You can see they only go back to 2011 spring, all right? The last line on here is, in that survey we also asked, what level of losses um, uh, are acceptable? What could you live with? What could you sustain? So if you had that level of losses, you could make them up. And that number has been 15% uh, bumped up a little bit to 19% this past year. Um, uh, or I'm sorry, back, it's back down towards 15. It's been as much as 19%, okay? Uh, beyond that, think of, uh, many people think of their bees as, um, uh, that are trying to make income as both a savings and a, um, a checking account. So in your checking account, you're selling some product, all right? Um, but you might have to go to your savings to, um, to um, buy that extractor or buy the truck to move them around. Well, so too with losses. 10, 15 percent of losses, you can make that up from what you have. You're going to have some strong colonies in the spring that actually have to be cut back. So you're going to do some divides, you're going to get some queens, uh, cut uh, swarm cells, whatever, you're going to get some, and you're going to make that up. So that's sort of in savings. But if you start bouncing above that 15%, what it means is that you're dipping into your capital. You've got to divide, if you want to get back to the same number, you've got to divide a colony that you could make honey with or that you could rent for pollination if you're doing that, that okay? Uh, or you could uh, sell as a nuke. So you're dipping into your capital, into your savings, right? So that 15%... No, I mean, these are living things. We'd like, love it to be zero, but that's not realistic. We're going to have losses. They're going to occur. The point is, at what level are these losses occurring? Now, when we take that same number and look at the 11 years and we divide the population by type of beekeeper by number of colony holdings, the top line, the blue line, represents most of us here, the backyarders, a few colonies, up to as many, perhaps, as 50, that loss over those 11 years is an average of 40%. The middle is, are those that are, have other jobs, but they're trying to make some income or they're using their bees as their retirement income, what we call sideliners. And the lowest bar, the yellow, is the commercial. These are people with 500 plus colonies, thousands usually. Um, their loss over those, that time period, 28%. Okay? So well above an accepted level. So maybe that all is not indeed fake news from those headlines, there is indeed a loss crisis. Right? Now, bees die for a number of different reasons. I'm going to focus in the next couple of slides on one of those. What I label as number one health issue, doo -doo 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 you know, news bulletin, number one health issue, varroa mites. Okay, varroa mites in our colonies. Um, the issue, particularly now, this time of year, the yellow line represents what normally happens to our bee colony during a year. It reaches its low point sometime in January, December, January, uh, perhaps 10,000 bees, perhaps a few more, then increases with spring with pollen availability, uh, good egg laying by the queen, good care for the, the worker brood, to perhaps peak out at 45,000, pretty good colony, 45,000 uh, bees that can do what we want, pollinate, uh, give us honey production. The mites, by on the other hand, over this winter peri period are not doing so well. And initially in the spring, they're, the old, their mites are old, the females are old, and they're really poor in reproduction. But eventually there are some more daughters, and so eventually mites start reproducing in our colony to the point that as our bee colonies are declining in numbers in the fall of the year, our mite numbers are still going up and are just reaching their peak. So that's a bad combination. I indicated the mite has all the advantages over the European bees, and this is one of these places. It is not in sync. It, uh, it, is, it is big and powerful at a time of year when it's kind of critical for our bees to get prepared to get through the overwintering period. Okay? Uh, so, this information we can use then in terms of our anticipation. Not reacting because the numbers are big all of a sudden, 
but anticipate they are going to get big. And so anticipation uh, beekeeping is trying to keep the lid on that mite population, trying to keep that peak at levels that are less damaging or often, in the case of commercials, very, uh, very much less damaging for their colonies. Okay? So it's all about the mites, our four-letter word. You're tired of hearing about mites. Okay? Um, I also, I've been doing a number of talks on the East and just come from a whole series in Michigan. And I do a talk that I talk about good news. And some of the good news about mites are that commercials generally, although you see the average 28, they're keeping it at a level that's more or less sustainable, under 25%. The synthetic material that we have, and we only have one, and through our history with mites since 1987, we've got our first one in 1989, we've only had one. Um, but the synthetic still works. That's Apivar, the, the, the Amitraz. Um, for those that do not want to use that or prefer not to use it, there are some organics that work pretty well, some acids and oils. More restrictive, don't clean out 99% of the mites, but do a pretty good job under the right conditions. Take smart beekeepers to use them, use them effectively. And of course then, as I indicate, if we use an integration of, of management against this formidable pest, not just chemical, but also using um, uh, techniques, uh, we can, that's a better approach and we can kind of keep ahead of it. So anticipatory beekeeping, what controls work? Well, now we've got a whole menu to select from. We can select from some things such as drone brood removal, a technique we can use but only in the spring, uh, oxalic acid uh, vaporization, a technique we can only use when there's virtually no brood in a colony uh, if we want to use it effectively. The synthetic, the apivar, that works under all conditions, but we don't want that in there when we're producing honey, so there's a severe limitation. Uh, the acids, uh, the thyme oil uh, down lower right, uh, brood rearing, screen bottom boards, hop guard. So we, we've got a bunch of things that can work. For all of these, that's not my talk today, but, but my take home message, and, and I'm, you're well aware, I'm sure, there is no magic bullet. No one technique, no one chemical works in all situations at all times for every beekeeper. So we have to be smart enough to do this anticipation and try to keep the lid on those mite numbers. Here's another tool, just as those were tools on that slide, here's another tool um, participating in the Bee, uh, Honey Bee Health Coalition. I'm the principal author for this. This is a tools for varroa management. So this is your one stop for the best information about this foe, about mites. Uh, information on how to sample, information on use of chemicals, when you would use them, pros and cons in their use, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, you can Google, this is free, I'm not going to sell it, no one's going to sell it to you, uh, .org, Honey Bee Health Coalition, all one word, .org, and download this for free. In addition, we just did a series of videos, 12 videos, so that if you've never done sampling with powdered sugar, but would like to see how it's done, we got a video for that, okay, we got a video on sampling, three to five minute videos. Uh, we got, a, if you've never used Apivar, but are considering it, thinking about it, what's, what might, why might I want to use it? We got a video for that. So there's a whole video on Apivar as well. Honeybeehealthcoalition.org, free download. It's a tool you really do need, okay? Uh, this was the 30th birthday of the Varroa mite in the United States. That's sad. But we had a birthday party, and we did it by asking individuals across the country to participate in a mitathon in a, in a, over a couple weekends in September. So this is the result. The red on this is a county in the U.S. Uh, over you know almost 3,000 counties and parishes in the U.S. that had numbers that were over 11 mites. So someone did either alcohol wash or powdered sugar wash, and in that county had a number over 11 mites. The green, on the other hand. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of scattered counties in Texas where that number was recorded. The green, on the other hand, has had only no mites or zero to three mites. Now this is a percentage. This is a percentage per 100 bees, okay? Um, I'll do in the, the bee math this afternoon, how do we get to this percentage, all right? Bee math, I know that's going to turn some of you off right away. It's going to be after lunch. You're going to be, you know, okay. Well, we're going to try it anyway, see how it works, all right? Um, 
This is a method, as is our survey for Be Informed, of a way for you to look over your beekeeping neighbor's fence, whether you participate or not. And I do encourage you to participate in these national things because this is, I think, very valuable. It's a snapshot. It's not what is happening now, this month, but it was a snapshot of what was happening back in September, and I think a very valuable one. So I do encourage you to participate in that. But it, whether you do or not, it's, it's an opportunity. You go to the bee meeting, your local bee meeting, you, 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 you see a fellow you know or a gal and say, well, how'd you do this year? Good, best year I had, worst year I had. You talk to someone else, uh, oh, I did okay, all right? Our famous thing is I get two more beekeepers up here, get Tim up here and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, someone else, another of your officers up here. Give us one question, you'll get, uh, you'll get nine different answers from the three of us, okay? All right, of course, all right, all right? Uh, but it's a way to look over your fence and get some additional information, all right? Now, truth in advertising here. I've been talking about mites, but it is really not the issue but it's the way that we attack the issue. Here's a bee with deformed wing. This is deformed wing virus, so it's really not the mites, but it's the fact that on feeding on our pupae and feeding on the adults before they slip into another cell to reproduce, the phoretic mites, they are actually enhancing, spreading and enhancing replication of colds, the common colds of bees. And they have a bunch of them. There's probably over, there's well over 30 viruses that we recognize, some very serious. Bees contact cashmere bee virus, the adult ca contact cashmere bee virus, three days they're dead. Just like that, very deadly virus. The problem with this virus is as you see it here, this is an adult bee, it contacted the virus by being fed by worker bees, and then during its pupil stage, in under the capping, um, the virus just started multiplying like crazy within the body of this bee. So this bee came out as an adult, didn't have enough blood volume to, to expand its wings, so it has the deformed wing condition. Um, it's not gonna fly, and it's not gonna live very long, two or three days. But in those two or three days, it's gonna be cared for like any other new bee is cared for in a colony. And all those caregivers are going to get the virus from it. So they're gonna get it as adults. Now once the wings are formed in adult bees, they don't regress and become deformed. So you got sick adults, uh, that have no symptoms, asymptomatic. Emerging sick pupae, such as this one, we deformed uh, virus, and you have the inoculum around, and, and then they're feeding it to the young. So all, and, and, uh, and the queen can do it as well with, uh, with, um, uh, with some genetics. So many ways of transmission of this particular virus. Now not every deformed wing virus is the same, okay? There are, there are different strains of this virus. But the issue, I, the point I'm trying to make is that is, this is a deadly virus that isn't quite as deadly as cashmere, but, but deadly serious for the, the social life, the population itself. Not as deadly ne necessarily for individual bees, okay? So there is good news, and the good news is, I've already talked about Varroa. We can manage the Varroa, and we can also manage the virus. Here's some work, um, and there's way too much on this slide, so let me just tell you. In the middle, this would be a normal colony. If we look at the various viruses, every one of these colors represent a different virus. Now, um, there's a, 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 an interesting video by a guy named Ron Hoskins from um, Swindon in England. He says he never treats, no treatment, honestly, no treatment. He's been doing locally selected bees, and he doesn't have a problem with virus. So the virus special went, specialist went and looked at his bees, and indeed he does have virus in his bees, but the predominant virus is a virus with deformed wing virus, is an avirulent form or strain of deformed wing virus. So indeed this fellow doesn't need to treat because although his bees have deformed wing virus, it's not the deadly form. Now these same people went to um, a, a natural, uh, uh, natural laboratory. They went to the islands of Hawaii. So uh, this is representing um, the island of Oahu, uh, Honolulu, where they are having a terrible time with varroa mite populations and losing an awful lot of colonies. So they looked at the virus titer there and they found um, instead of that big mix of viruses, they have one form, primarily one form of deformed wing virus and it's the most deadly. So yes, varroa is feeding on their bees and yes, they're losing lots of colonies, 
where the fellow with locally selected stuff, a different strain of Varroa, has Varroa, has virus, but he's not losing those colonies and not treating for his colonies. We too can have that. That would be an example of what we, we would label um, uh, suppressed mite reproduction. And the reason he's doing that is they have the virus, but it's, it, but it's not killing bees. When the mite goes into the cell to lay her eggs, she doesn't do a very good job. So she does, she's not as successful in reproduction, i.e. anticipation. Keep a lid on that population because the mites themselves, so these are weaker mites is what we're talking about because the virus they're spreading is not as, as uh, uh, deadly for bees. And this would be an example of what we see in our colony of PMS, this condition in the fall where the brood just looks terrible. Snotty brood, cruddy brood, whatever name we're going to give it to it, often UF, EFB, often some sack brood, often chalk brood, all in the same colony, in the same brood pattern, in fact, okay? Adults that just don't look good, go in the winter um, looking sort of limping along, not enough bees to cover the brood, come out of spring very weak and then may die uh, before we can intervene with our bees in the springtime, okay? PMS. Here's another look at the Hawaii data from 2009. So these two islands, Maui and, and Kanai, do not have mites, all right? And this represents the more virulent form of deformed wing virus because in the bees there is a, this huge mixture of different viruses. Here um, is the Oahu. You can see on Oahu in 2009, same sampling, nothing but the more virulent DWV. Lots of uh, mites, lots of uh, uh, dying colonies. Um, these three middle ones represent 2009 Big Island spring, 2009 Big Island later in the year, and 2010. You can see what's happening with the, the, this whole virus milieu of what many different ones. It's becoming much more uh, restricted, and the, the more serious deformed wing virus, the virulent one, becoming much more serious. So Hawaii is, uh, this isn't lab experiments, this is an actual place where these things occur, so like a living, living laboratory that they've been able to document very nicely. Okay. So with all of that, if in anticipation, what are we going to do? We have tools, you should have some of those tools, learn how to use some of the tools, but, but where is the bottom line? What's going to be an ultimate solution? Um, we've got to have better European race bees, better able to fight the mite. We've got to have those that have this SMR, those that have the Varroa selective hygiene or Varroa sensitive hygiene. These are bees that actually can tell that Mrs. Mite is in that cap cell, she's feeding on, her, uh, on their potential sister, and they would then yank the capping off and yank the bee out. So they stop one mite from reproducing for every bee they yank out. This is what we call varroa sensitive hygiene, developed from bee bees collected in Michigan, enhanced from a uh, USDA uh, program at Baton Rouge. Now, both these bees are terrible bees for, for beekeeping. You don't want to keep VSH bees. They're just not good. They came from trees primarily. Uh, they swarm all the time. They're kind of nasty at times. But we want that quality of detecting mites in cells. So what we want to try to do is work these characteristics, these behaviors of sensing mites in a cell and uncapping the cells, stopping a mite from reproducing, into our bee stock. We have others, Russian bees. They faced the, the mite much longer than our European bees. We brought them here, checked them out on Avery Island in the Gulf. Um, and now from some select queen breeders, you can get Russian queen stock. Uh, better, they are better at fighting mites. Uh, old world carniolan, not just carny bees, not the carniolan bees, but those where um, the people in Washington State have gone and collected the semen from the drones that are, are real carniolan bees, inseminated them artificially, and then have a selection old world carniolan. Now that's not a great bee for Texas because carny bees are not a great Texas bee for most of you, but it's great bee for us in the Pacific Northwest where we've got cold, wet, damp, rainy, day after day after day. I'm, I'm not working for the uh, local Chamber of Commerce trying to promote Oregon for you, am I? Um, but work for us there. Uh, the Minnesota Hybrid, a great bee for commercial beekeepers where you're producing lots of honey short season. The Cafag bees, that's basically one of those that I have in Bolivia. It's a bee that uses a lot more propolis. Africanized bees use a lot more propolis. 
and they don't have an issue with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Varroa mites. Anko biters, the bees developed at this program at, at, uh, at Purdue. These are the bees that are better groomers, will groom mites, the phoretic mites, off of the adults. So if you've got a reproductive female and she gets groomed off the back of a bee, she's not going to get into a cell and reproduce. So it can be very effective at keeping a lid on that population, okay? So anticipation is selected stock, selected even better, local stock, because what does someone who's, produce, who's supplying you bees from Louisiana or from California or from Hawaii, Queens, or from Georgia bees, what do they know about your backyard in, uh, here in Texas? They're supplying you with a good bee, a very good bee, but it might not be the best bee for you, for members of your association, for your backyard. Whereas local stock are perhaps, in most cases we can demonstrate, a better bee. Um, so that's what anticipation is about. Not reacting, not accepting what is out there, but in fact trying to manipulate, manage the stock so that we have a better bee that does what we want it to do, okay? For the California producers, they need lots of queens. So they have a very good queen, it'll take off right away. That's what they're selecting for because when they sell you that queen, you expect results. So when you buy the queen, you get results, all right? It may not last through a season, may not last into the next season, but you get results. That's what you're buying the queen for. Locally selected stock is that bit above, okay? That's that extra that we, I think we need. So here we are at this time of year. Again, let me finish then with this anticipation. So what should we be thinking? Um, in September, the bees in our county have to raise fat bees. Fat fall bees. Now they don't look fatter, but they are loaded with a material that helps the bee suspend their aging process. So instead of living five or six weeks, normal lifespan of a worker bee, bees that are fat with this material, the material is vitellogenin, stored in fat bodies of the workers, suspends the aging process of the worker bees and they can live five or six months in more northern climates. In other words, through our winter season, right? So that's what we should be doing in terms of our anticipation is fat bees. And to get there as well, because they're going to be somewhat confined, we got to have fat colonies, all right? Um, so anticipation, helping our bees get to this point that the individual bees have a lot of this vitelligenin. Now, how do we get there? It's all about the nutrition, all about bee nutrition. Um, optimal nutrition helps bees boost their immune system to uh, help fight these things such as varroa and the fowl broods and chalk brood and, and uh, sack brood, all of them I mentioned, and helps um, when they get out there in that environment and they hit something that they shouldn't be in by accident or, or, or uh, mostly by accident, but, but you know, that's dangerous going out of your hive, um, that they have the detoxifying enzymes to help get over that shock to their systems, <laughs> all right? So that's what optimal nutrition does. So where do we get that optimal nutrition in our anticipation? It's all about pollen, okay? I mentioned my Africanized bees do a great job. Tim indicated that they have uh, certain sales outlets that really are looking for that fresh pollen, not the stored stuff, not the stuff from the nutrition stores where it's been, uh, where, who, who knows where it's been, what kind of conditions it's been under, but the good stuff, the freshly collected pollen. Uh, that pollen varies a great deal among sources. You see 10 to 40% crude protein in the source, the pollen source itself. It is also uh, a source not just of crude protein, but of the essential as amino acids. That's the building blocks. Bees cannot make their own of 10 essentials. They've got to have that in their diet to have normal, healthy, um, non-stressed bees. So they have to get that from their diet. It's also a source for lipids, minerals, vitamins, and bees, too, cannot make cholesterol. That's very important for a number of enzyme systems, et cetera, so they, too, have to get that from the pollen that they're, that they're collecting. And then they can then make that into this secret ingredient, the vitellogenin, that, which is a you know, big name, glycolipoprotein, um, uh, for increased longevity. Anticipatory, bee nutrition, very important, especially that protein, critical when the colonies are rearing um, their winter bees. Okay, five minutes? Ten, okay, good. Um, 
anticipatory. Here is that dreaded snot brood. Doesn't this look ugly? Don't send this picture to, to Aunt May up in the, up in the Dallas area. She, she won't buy your honey. This, this is ugly brood, okay, snot brood, cruddy brood. Um, so what should we do? Anticipatory, we can kill them, colonies that have this, or we are optimists as beekeepers. You've got to be an optimist to be a beekeeper. There's no other way, particularly with these losses for mites. We can cure them. Well, can we cure them? Can we cure them? <laughs> Whatever way we want to phrase that, sentence, that, that phrase. Okay, can we cure them? Yes and no. Um, in some cases, this colony, if you see this, this is a ghost of a colony. And although you are not going to do it, kill them. I know you're not going to do it. Okay? You're going to be the eternal beekeeping optimist and try to cure them. Throw the kitchen sink at them. And sometimes the kitchen sink is just as effective as everything else that we can throw at them. Because what's happened? Sick bees leave home. That's a quality of being a social bee. You leave home when you're sick. So they leave, and what happens in our apiary, if we have a colony that is very sick with mites, those bees leave home, the mites affect short-term memory and a bunch of other things, and here the colonies have no address. Try to figure out where you live when you come back to this apiary after you've been a couple miles away. So they drift, they go into other colonies. So if one of these colonies is a mite bomb, in other words, generating mites, it's going to share. Did a study in Maryland where we put a sick colony out, sick colonies out, and, and, and uh, clean colonies, mark the bees. The sick colony showed up, the, the bees marked bees from the sick colony showed up in every other colony in the same apiary, and the apiary is up to three miles away. The colonies, uh, the bees from the healthy colonies that were marked uh, showed up in a couple of the other colonies in the apiary, and then another couple of apiary. And that was it. Okay. So sick bees leave home because they're sick. It's a social response. And in so doing, they can share with others. There's a really nice rest of the story here. This is a photo of a beekeeper in central, uh, center of Michigan beekeepers, Cone Beekeeper, center of Michigan. He rears every year about uh, uh, 800 queens. He has got ankle biters in his stock. He has purchased the VSH quality from uh, the fellow in Louisiana. And he has incorporated and has a local stock. And for five bucks, he's giving all the members of this association locally selected stock that has some resistance against mites. Okay. So just by accident, I picked his slide to put that mite bomb on top of it. And it turns out there's a whole other rest of the story. He doesn't have mite bombs because he has the locally selected stock. He is spot treating, yes, he is spot treating because he is also rearing drones, which is just as critical as rearing the, the queens, okay? So those drones are real generators of mites, so you have to be careful, all right? So there's a nice rest of the story. Uh, let's finish a couple other things. Uh, spring of the year. What should we anticipate is going to happen rather than trying to react? What happens to our colonies in the spring of the year? They get, they get back at us, don't they? They swarm, right? Spring build up, some colonies will start swarm preparations. Will you chase them or prevent them? Anticipate, which is which? Chasing them is reacting. Preventing them is anticipatory. Uh, making spring splits using queen cells. Here we got a county with three uh, queen cells. Um, uh, we've got to anticipate here real quick because look at that first one um, on the left of the slide. You see how the wax has been really, really trimmed from the, from the tip. And look at that little slit. What's happening? Uh, queen's ready to get out of there. Okay. And yes, the bees may be doing their vibratory, they may be bouncing up and down on it to keep her in prison, but boy, when she starts slitting like that, she's going to come out. And so what's she going to do? What you're going to do if you're a self-respecting queen and you're the first one out? Go after those other two. Right, exactly. Okay, so here we got to anticipate real quick, all right? Um, so rather than chasing them, here's some other aspects. Do you, we want to get the chase them? Do we want to bait them? Or our smart bees up at A&M that uh, Juliana is training, uh, they train them to come to them. Okay. Uh, one final one. Here's the end of the season. 
Maybe we haven't uh, uh, taken a harvest. The end of the active season. Bee colonies are going down. But colonies are often pretty strong here. That's what this uh, graph emphasizes. So what you're going to do, okay? After super removal, what the, bees are, uh, what the bees you are going to do with a strong populous hive? What you're going to do, okay? Bees going to do anything for you the rest of that season? No, and they're likely to eat up the profits. That's honey that you potentially could harvest if you took it away from them. So in anticipation, rather than reacting as they do that, uh, what you can do is build resource hives. Make some nukes. Those bees aren't going anywhere the rest of the season. So bring them back to the spring hives. Make them start their season all over again. So make up some nukes, okay? Resource hives, these nukes can be a spare queen, provide additional brood to bolster colonies, can be a clean source for honey, can be fresh clean comb because often you'll put a frame, a foundation in there. Brand new starting colonies will do a good job with foundation. They are fantastic. This is brood breaking, one of the best uh, non-chemical techniques we can use to reduce mite buildup. They're a joy to work, smaller colonies. Who wants to get out there? All those supers on a colony, it's hot, you're sweaty already in your bee suit just getting it on. Who wants to go out and manage all this huge stack of bees? Little colonies, a lot of fun, okay? May not even use your veil or your, your coveralls after a bit uh, if you're really crazy, okay? Uh, be less costly to uh, overwinter. Uh, yeah, you're going to lose a few more overwinter, but you don't have as much invested in them. And now if you're using leftover bees that have nowhere to go, nothing to do, you've anticipated that, and you then are, rather than trying to react and, and losing big, full, strong colonies. The key is um, always take resources responsibly, and they're much easier to make when conditions are good. Okay? So spring nukes are easier to make than sometimes summer nukes, but fall nukes, as they're reducing in size, sometimes are also easy to make as well. Okay? When you make a resource hive, what's your preference? You want to reduce swarming? Spring, spring resource hive. Harvest will or will not be affected. If you are not doing this responsibly, you can really cut into your harvest, taken at the wrong time. But post-harvest, what are those bees going to do anyway? Um, and, and if you don't, maybe your bees are just, you know, there's an optimum going into winter, and it's smaller, not bigger. We, we learned that by mistake. It's wrong. Okay, got the sign, all right? Um, if you want to get the same amount of honey, consider this alternative. Here I have a tower hive. I have two sort of ordinary average colonies here. Maybe my swarm captures, maybe my nukes I started, uh, maybe my packages that I bought, what it, my splits that I made. I push two together, put a common excluder over the two, and then they share the supers. So worker bees from the right hive go in the same supers as worker bees from the left hive. Tower supering. Good way to, to still make some profit. Finally, an anticipatory beekeeping. You're going to need some help, okay? So is this you in this picture? And is this a couple of your friends? After a couple of those evenings out there or moving bees, they may no longer be friends. So you've got to have a good number of friends to be a beekeeper, right? Okay, a couple of friends. All right. Finally, the last thought. What about this? More anticipation. Bees need good resources. This is my daughter's colony, backyard in Oregon. That's her colony. And I just love going to visit my daughter and help her as a mentor for her, her, her colony. Okay, she's now got two. Um, next year it's going to be four, and then Tim, would you say 16, and then 30,000 30, more or whatever. But notice what we have in her yard. Now this is Oregon. That is marijuana. It is indeed. So when we finish with the inspection... What we do, I'm taking this picture from the porch of her house. We go to the porch, and she gives me these brownies. <laughs> I tell you, I, I, she gives me these brownies, and boy, they're good. Let me tell you, I'm so proud when I leave. I've been mentoring my daughter. We got a nice, strong colony. We control the mites, and damn, those brownies taste so good. Thank you. I appreciate your attention. Through much of today and tomorrow in the workshops, I'll be out front. I do have a few books and uh, be glad to talk with you. Uh, if you'd like to continue the dialogue, there is my email, something I said or didn't say, something I did, said that didn't make a lot of sense. Be glad to continue that. Thank you to, I'll be back this afternoon, but thank you to, the, to Chris, Texas Beekeepers, for the invitation. Wow, a professor that talked to us in language we understood.
Thank you, Dr. Karen, very much indeed. So did we learn something from that? Go to Oregon <laughs> and send the Africanized bees to Bolivia. Um, I wanted to mention something about auction items. Is Jennifer here? Oh, thank goodness. Um, a little bit about auction items. On the tables at the back of this hall, you'll see all the auction items that are to support the Queen program. Most of them are silent auction items, which will close sometime tomorrow. Um, the bigger items will be up for auction at the awards dinner tonight. So please do go look at the things you're going to bid lots of dollars for. We'd appreciate it. Well, I don't think I need to introduce Jennifer Berry. She's um, European, like me, from a funny place called Ireland. She did a fantastic day yesterday um, at the Thursday workshop. She has promised me that this is not a...